Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. An honor to be back with you guys again. Happy Monday for those that are joining us for the first time. Welcome. Good morning, Liron. How are you? Good morning to everybody who is tuning in right now. Had opportunity last night to speak to a great group of people from Lakewood, New Jersey, from all over. It was really, really special. So good morning to all those that are joining us today for the first time from there. We've been talking a lot about this concept called acting as if and be do have. Yesterday we introduced the concept of be do have and we, we, we touched on it beforehand, but I, I really want to sort of delve into it today because until we start to see ourselves and our actions and our intentions as worthy of real thought and contemplation, we risk running around life and potentially going in the wrong direction. Yesterday, last night on this program, which I really enjoyed being on, someone made, made the point that there are times in one's business career where you're making money. Some people are able to start companies and make real money. And they end up spending that money on things that are completely unnecessary. And then times are, get tough and they're really stuck. Because if you spend money when you have it on things you don't need, and you now put yourself in a category where it's expected of you, you increase your lifestyle, you get used to buying things that are, at, that are above what one would typically buy, but for this successful business. And now that the world goes through a change, what ends up happening is you've placed yourself in, an, in, in a precarious situation in life. Now you have to maintain your lifestyle. Now you have to keep on spending and you don't have the money or worse when you had it as opposed to investing it and now having it for, for down times. Now you're totally stuck. This happens because we don't spend enough time in our own contemplation. It doesn't happen because people are, are, are bad people. People are trying to make bad decisions. It doesn't happen because people are trying to compete. As much as we'd like to think that, it's not true. We're good people. We, we want to do good. We want to feel good. This happens because we don't spend enough time in our intentions. We're so busy running through the world that we don't take the time to think about why I am doing what I am doing. And as sad as it is to somebody who opens up a successful business and then starts spending beyond their means and loses their business and then now has to really cut back and is suffering, as sad as that may be, it is much sadder. It is much sadder for someone to be at the end of their lives where their physical strength starts to wane and they start to look back and realize that I spent decades pursuing things that I didn't even want. I've spent, I read this stat the other day that like the average American spends something like a decade of his life on Instagram or on social media, like a decade. If you count up all the hours, I gotta look it up. I'm sure Andy's looking it up right now. If you count up all the hours that we spend, just like in between social media, I forgot the stat. I'll look for it. It's something like a decade of our lives is in just like scrolling in social media, and like you look back and you're like a decade. The work of be do have is the work of understanding who we are in order for us to get closer to doing the things that we're meant to be doing. It's not for the middle of the day. It's not for most of our lives. That's the time for action. But it's during the times of thought. So what is that? It's this concept that in order for me to become greater, I can't allow myself to go through the usual path of greatness. Now watch how this works. It's like a double-edged sword. This is a counterintuitive approach to growth. Most people think the way you grow is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, right? That's how we're typically taught. That's not how you grow in life. That's not how anyone grows in life. If you see kids don't grow that way, they don't get like a little bigger, a little bigger. They, they have something called growth spurts. The kid's five, two, and then all of a sudden becomes five, seven. You don't grow the way intellectually. You ever like talk to like a little kid? It's like, you know, you're talking to like a one-year-old or an eight-month-old and they're just like 
repeating things back to you, and then all of a sudden, someday they just start talking. You're like, when did this happen? And then now they're human beings. You ever have this? People mature in different ways. So the growth that we have in life isn't like getting better, because what happens is, as you start to grow in life, your brain starts to put you in a catch-22. In order to become someone, somebody much bigger than yourself, you have, to, you have to act outside yourself. And if you've been with me for a little bit, you know we speak about neuroplasticity, so that your brain is exposed to the same things, it's hard to break through that. You're used to doing things a certain way. Now, you grow ultimately by adding and adding and adding through the habits, there's no question. And this is where I want to make sure I can split this hair here. The actual growth in your brain is by adding things, habits, adding plus one. But that's not really where the growth takes place. That's solidifying the growth. Adding habits, adding a little bit more, doing a little bit more every day, right? Increasing yourself is how you orient your brain around change. But that's following Real growth. Real growth is when you can see yourself as something beyond where you are right now. Real growth is when you could leapfrog. And the way you leapfrog is you recognize that do have be is not the appropriate way of life. You don't do things to have things to be something. It's be do have. You ask yourself, who do I want to be? That, that question is the question of life. And it changes all the time. You don't got to find the answer. You have to ask the question. This is one of the greatest distinctions in study. I remember when I was in law school. I'll never forget this. When I was in law school, I remember law school's different because even law school is like that a little bit. But not, I don't know. I felt like I was in Columbia. It was like a very stodgy. It was a great school, but it was like stodgy. And like, I remember like I would study Talmud in the morning. And the whole goal of Talmudic study is who's got the better question. And the rabbi teaching will say, I don't know, sometimes. And the guy who, like, in, in Yiddish is called to shlug. The guy who, like, like um, I don't know how to translate that. Like, I guess who, like, stops him in his tracks, who asks an unanswerable question. He's the king. There's no answers in Talmudic study. Now you learn around it and you orient and then you get your answer. You go to like a very stodgy academic institution. Again, at the higher levels, it's like this because they, that's how they grow. But at least at the lower levels, you see this professor and he says something. You don't question your professor. No one raises their hand and is like, hi, Professor So-and-so who won like, you know, a Nobel Prize for torts or whatever. Like, but doesn't, this, doesn't it say in this statute? The guy's looking at you like, what? Did you look at the textbook that I wrote? Yeah, why don't you read that again? Because we're not looking for the answer. Growth doesn't find answers because there's no answers in spirituality. It's just digging. You don't hit a source. There's the joy in the dig. The joy comes in the game of life. I don't know if I told you that Julian Edelman quote. Julian Edelman was the, uh, the, the New England Patriot that won the MVP for the Super Bowl two Super Bowls ago. Those that are not following football. He's a Jewish guy and he won MVP, which is like, you know, it's an unbelievable thing for a Jew. Just think about the, what has to happen for a Jewish male to win the MVP of not only a sport, but of football. We're not a very tough people. I mean, we are when you put uniforms on us, but typically we're not. So they, they, they interviewed him on a podcast. They said, like, this is incredible. Great day of your life. You won Super Bowl, you won MVP. What, what's the, what are you looking forward to most? And they're waiting. The, the, the guys are waiting for him to say, like, I'm looking forward to, like, you know, spending time with my family. I'm going away to, you know, to this island. I'm going to Disneyland. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to sleep for the first time. I don't got to get my body beaten up by 200 pound guys, right? And he says, Oh, what I'm looking for most? I'm looking forward to, to uh, the training camp. That means the start of the next season. They go, Training camp? You just finished the Super Bowl. So he says the greatest line. He says, the only thing better about winning a Super Bowl is fighting for a Super Bowl. That's greatness. It's the fight that's more exciting than the win. It's the question that's more exciting than the answer. It's the searching for the B and trying to hold on to your B that is more exciting even than the have. Right? That's the idea. Do have B is the principle of how they take us through life.
do things so you have things so that it can be something. When we think that someone's going to pat us on the back and say, now you are this. Welcome to the wealthy club. Welcome to the righteous club. Welcome to the good husband club. Welcome to the good dad club. You know when you're going to be a good dad? When you see your kids come down the aisle. And now it's done. Really? You know how many dads begin parenting at the next level once their kids get married? The stuff that is important, you never get to. No one's going to pat you on the back and say, now you are. That's the physical way of looking at the world. The spiritual looking of the world is that your soul is constantly changing and a real acceptance of something. A real decision actually shifts your soul. It shifts who you are. It shifts your be. Be, you change your be when you want to change your be. You change your be when you decide this is who you are. It's hard because it's going to change again. You got to just look over the hill and you got to hold on to that thing because that B is going to change your actions. Do you see how that works? I hope I, that's clear. In order, Andy, tell me if I'm clear or if I'm not being clear. It, the, it, the order of growth really takes place in your brain. The brain is neuroplastic. Neuroplastic means the only way you really grow is if you're adding new neurological connections. So your real actual growth takes place step by step, piece by piece. But that's, that step by step is just following. It is just cl closing out who you really are, which is your being. So how do you do it? So let's get back to the workbook. For those who don't have a workbook, let me know. If you're on the WhatsApp groups, I'll have Andy. Uh, thank you, Andy, the best. If, if, if you don't have it, I'll have Andy post it. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. Starting tonight at 8 o'clock um, for the next four weeks, I'm doing a marriage talk for guys only. Lori Palatnik is doing it for the ladies. I'm doing it for the men four weeks in a row, 8 o'clock every night for four weeks. 8 to 8.30 if you want. Andy's going to post on the, um, on the chat and on our WhatsApp groups, the link if you want to join. So now here's the, let's go back to the workbook. Remember in the workbook we spoke about the vision. Now the vision, the vision that we have is our ideal day. If you really want to be brave, do your eulogy. Eulogy is a little more complex. Not everybody can handle it. But if you're really doing a eulogy, which is someone else eulogizing you, and you're doing an ideal day, and you really get to a place where you really get underneath and you say this is this is my ideal day and this is what I want to remember for you're pretty you're pretty you're getting a couple layers down that surface like if you're going like what do I want to do in my life if you're, if you're feeling like I feel empty today if you're in that space where you're going like mm, I don't feel it and you really sit down and you give yourself time and do a you spend 10 15 20 minutes on your eulogy this is who I am this is the one I'll be remembered for right and it's in the book it's in the workbook or it's in the book if you have the book or you sit down and you do like a real ideal day remember the two different pieces of the same of the two different sides of the same coin the goal of eulogy is to cut out all of the fear of but what if I can't right because when someone passes when someone's at the end of their lives they're not scared of anybody anymore right and the goal of the ideal day is to say listen I can do it now I don't have to worry about um, sometimes in the ideal day is more practical because the eulogy you're thinking like values. Once you have those two pieces, and you'll see in the workbook, I forgot which page it is, but I'll, if you look through it, I'm going to look through it now even. If you look into the workbook, what you find is as you get through it, you'll be able to understand a little bit more who you want to be. Because when you start to, yeah, I'm looking, here it is. It's, this is the exercise called going all in. What ends up happening is your vision starts to give you an indication of what you're looking for to be. I want to be rich. You know what? If you want to be rich, just be honest that you want to be rich with yourself. Just, just be honest with yourself that you want to be rich. It's probably the right way to say it. Sentence structure is critical. Just be honest. I want to be rich. Fine. Maybe you want to be rich. Maybe in 10 years from now, you'd be like, whoa. I'd like to be rich, but I want to be, you know, loved. Okay. I want to be a red husband. I want to be, I want to be connected to God. I want to be happy. When you're staring down at your eulogy and at your 
ideal day, what you now have to start to search for, you have to start to search for the bees that are hidden within. It's hard to find who, it's hard to find who you want to be. It's a very esoteric question. It can drive people crazy. Some people looking looking to find themselves. It's very hard to find oneself because it's, yourself is a soul, and your you, our brain is physical. So to find oneself, it's like trying to like hold and grab two plus two equals four. Where is two plus two equals four? How do you hold a concept when you want to hold yourself? Where where is that? You don't find yourself. You search for yourself. It's the search for meaning. It's not the finding meaning. Remember the famous book by Viktor Frankl. It's man's search for meaning, not man's acquisition of meaning. You never acquire meaning. Maybe the next life you do it. Maybe we have to. Win, but but when you're in this world, you don't acquire things that are 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 not in this world like spirituality. What you do is you search. So if you're sitting with your ideal day and you take the time for it, if you're sitting with your eulogy, you take the time for it and you look at it and you go, what are, what are the things I want to be? It starts to inform you of, of the things that you want to be in life. You know, here's the secret. Once you decide what you want to be, just make a decision to be that already. I want to be happy. I have so much in my life and I'm unhappy. And I've never been happy. I was fetching as a kid. I got married at, the, at, a, at a young age to a wonderful woman and I'm like complaining about her. I'm always complaining. I want to just be happy. Great. It's all through my you, it's all through my idea. Great. Make a decision to be happy. But I don't feel happy. You're not supposed to feel it. It's your soul. Your brain's the computer. Your soul is deeper than the computer. Once you decide to do something, you make a decision to do it, but it doesn't feel like me. It's not supposed to feel like you. Okay, then how, well, how do I feel happy? Once you decide to be happy, and that's your decision, you'll know it's a decision when it's a piece of you. You really want it. You're not going to do it tomorrow. You now you know you don't want to lose weight when you go, I'm going on a diet tomorrow. The minute the word goes tomorrow, that means I don't want to go on a diet. I just want to eat more food and feel less guilty. Tomorrow is a great way to say never and not feel guilty about it. You know you want to lose weight when you go, I want to lose weight. And as soon as you say that, you're like, I don't want to touch that. I spoke to someone yesterday who was dating. He's a little older. Hopefully he's watching this. Great guy. Great guy. I can tell right away. He says to me, I want to get married. I'm like, no, you don't. He's like, yeah, I do. I'm like, no, you don't. He's like, no, I really do. I'm like, if you wanted to get married, you would tell yourself, in a year, I'm going to be married. You would obsess over it. You want to be married? You got to wake up in the morning. If you want to be married, then as you hang up the phone, you pick up a phone and go, who can I date? That's how you know you want to be something. And if you're not, if, if, if you'd like to be married, Wonderful. If you'd prefer to be married, wonderful. People prefer chocolate over vanilla. People would like to be rich, but most people who would like to be rich don't end up being rich unless God just hands it to them. Because liking isn't enough. You gotta override your brain. You gotta override years of neuroplasticity. You gotta override years of stuff in there. You think you're gonna override years of stuff by a preference? And then what happens when it gets hard and your brain goes, are you out of your mind? What happens if it gets difficult? Your brain goes, can we be comfortable? You're like, yeah, I'd prefer to be rich, but I also prefer to sleep late. I'd like to be married, but also like to be able to have the most perfect girl land on my lap and tell me that, that I'm amazing and be able to like just walk down the aisle with the first girl I meet or the third girl I meet. You have to want it. This is unlocking what is the most powerful spiritual force you have inside you called desire. And we'll touch upon this tomorrow. we got to get the significance and connection. I hope you don't leave. I hope you stick with me a little bit longer. We have a lot to talk about. But there's nothing bigger than Ratzon. For those who speak Hebrew and understand Hebrew, the word Ratzon means desire. We say a verse every day. God opens his hands, and he fills the Chochai, every human being, Ratzon, whoever has Ratzon. Ratzon is not, I'd, I'd like it. Rotson is I need it. 
the reason why the state of Israel is one of the greatest places in the universe, the greatest startup world, is not because they would like to survive. They need to survive. And it brings out the best in them. As soon as you determine what you want to be in life, what ends up, you know how you feel it? Because you need it. And when you feel like you need it, you look around and go, how do I do it? And that's where we get to the rituals. All right, we'll talk about this tomorrow. For those who join us for the first time, welcome. For those that are back, thank you very much. Um, Andy posted the, the, the workbook. Andy, if you post the workbook on the chat, if not, the WhatsApp groups, if not, you can email me, Charlie, at Charlie Harari. And I'll give you those workbooks. We're going to hit it today, tomorrow, the next day. We'll keep on rolling. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Have an amazing, amazing day with God's help. With God's help. I really can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Have a great day.